A lot of people say, I don't care what other people think about me. Being honest with myself, I do not care what other people think about me. Is that something that you think most people could do? I think they could if, if they want to bad enough and they're willing to learn. You have to have a mindset that's open to learning and you have to know how to learn, which is a major thing. Does anyone else just want to sell everything they have, quit their job and move into the woods? Buy some land with low property taxes, spend a year building some solar and rainwater collection to completely get away from the bills? Just live out in nature, raise your own food, get healthy, learn the old school ways of making food, maybe build an outdoor kitchen with pallets. Of course, there's the whole struggle of giving up some modern conveniences, but how much do you really have to give up? Sure, you might have to build your own internet tower and point it through the holes in the trees to a cell tower way over there. Live in a camper for a couple years till you build your cute little cabin. But really, you don't have to give up all the luxuries. Why can't you play online games in the middle of the woods? Off-grid solar power doesn't always have to be a battery with jumper cables to a light bulb. Maybe you can run some air conditioning or high-pressure water out of the sink. Then if you just want fresh mountain air, step outside and breathe in. My goal is self-sufficient, luxurious, cheap living. Welcome to my house. Meet Nate Petrovsky, a man who has gained millions of followers while homesteading and stewarding over a hundred acres of land. Nate's story shows the power of perseverance, faith, hard work, and more. His followers enjoy his content for his authentic personality, his humility, and his commitment to inspiring people to embrace the simple life with purpose and meaning. Nate contacted me years ago for a coaching call and that's when I witnessed his desire to make his vision of freedom come to life. Our conversation is all about Nate and where he is on his journey now. I hope you enjoy. So Nate, I recently watched your story that you released and you've, you've been through quite a bit these last few years. I mean, really your whole life has been quite the journey. So it has. I want to kind of catch you people up to speed with with who you are and what you're about um your main thing is homesteading so talk a little bit about why homesteading what you're doing and just a little bit about you sure well i started homesteading just about four years ago now just a couple days beyond four years um before that i was a general contractor had a uh, construction business and it was it was fun actually i really loved the work but it just got kind of overwhelming and I was trying to buy land where I was so I could get a bigger facility and, and just expand the business so I could afford to pay the taxes on the land I wanted to buy and just decided one day you know what this is all this is all too much and I bought land in West Virginia which was far cheaper than where I was in Pennsylvania the land taxes are almost nothing they're not nothing but they're very low and all of a sudden I didn't need to make the uh, large amounts of income compared to where I was so that kind of just started the homesteading journey and saving money is pretty much a, a big part of homesteading, at least from what I've seen most people do. And the way I wanted to do it was geared towards reducing monthly bills. Yeah. I I remember talking to you, like, I think it was, it must have been four years ago or so, or before you started homesteading, like yeah. recently or shortly before you started, we were talking about personal finance. Um, you contacted me after filling out a questionnaire for um, financial coaching. And we talked about your homesteading journey and what you were planning to do. And then um, when we got back in touch, I'm like, oh, here he is. He's doing everything exactly like what we talked about, what he plans to do. He's executing amazingly. So it was really cool to see that happen. Yeah, for sure. I, I feel like a lot of people talk about homesteading, but as far as like actually making a plan and then following through, that's that's the hard part. And I'm thrilled that I'm actually able to be doing that. Yeah, that's and that's exactly the reason why I figured it would be ideal to talk to you about all this stuff, because like you said, a lot of people want to do it, but capitalizing on the idea is it takes a whole different level of character. So hope to get more into that and, and figure out, you know, give the people something to aim toward and see really what's involved in all aspects, because it's it's definitely no easy feat to get there. For sure, yeah. No, it's it's been a it's been a challenging journey, no question. <laughs> so tell me about your your parents. Um, in your story, you talk about your family, and you know you had some mishaps here and there with siblings and things like that. You also talk about your upbringing, but have your parents been supportive of you homesteading? Was that something that they had in mind for you since you were a kid, or does it matter to them? Tell me about that. 
Yeah, no, I, I would say this is probably not at all where they anticipated I'd ever end up. They're both college educated and my schooling and everything about my upbringing was geared towards um, following the same path, you know, of college education and, and get some type of, you know, job in, you know, a white collar field. And so it, it really just wasn't for me. Like it just didn't jive with my personality, sitting down with books and stuff. Just, I mean, you have to do it, but, um, you know, just just doing that just was not working at all for me. Um, and so they, they, um, didn't gear me towards this lifestyle. I don't know that they really approved or disapproved of it. Um, once I turned 18, I moved out and pretty much made my own decisions without really, um, support or, you know, not, you know, non-support yeah. either. Um, I was, I was just making my, my choices as an adult and, and living life. Yeah. And I mean, you're, you're doing it. So moving out, that's another thing, you know, moving out early on and supporting yourself. I guess if you're doing that, the, your parents might not be thoroughly pleased, but at least you're holding your own <laughs> weight, which is, is nice to see. For sure. Yeah, no, it was pretty much, you know, kind of the unwritten rule that once you turn 18, I mean, you, you go take care of yourself and, and support yourself or get higher schooling in order to do so. Um, but yeah, you know, living at home in my parents' basement until I'm age 35, I knew that was definitely not an option. <laughs> uh yeah that seems like more of a commonplace now yeah it does it does in some ways you know um what what about now so full circle to where you are now you're homesteading and you know you're operating your own business and doing well on social media and things now are they has their support changed at all or i mean are they kind of still like oh, i wish he would have been a doctor or something like that no I, I would i would say in that aspect they're fully supportive i mean i am you know taking care of myself and, and building a life for myself. It's not at all what they had envisioned, but it's kind of hard to actually envision where your kid's going to end up, I suspect. So yeah. um, the fact that it's, it's working for me, I think they're happy for me. And, and um, you know, they're they're definitely supportive of, of what I'm doing. Good. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> I, I remember also in your story, you talked about being homeschooled. And I'm actually, we, we homeschool our children. We have two young children. And... I've, from what I've seen across the board, you know, with multiple people who've been homeschooled, it could either be a really good situation or not so good. And it's kind of resented. So which camp do you think you're in? Are you fortunate? Are you glad that you were homeschooled or would you have rather been public schooled or what's your take on that? I'm glad I was, was homeschooled. Um, you know, if, if I had, to, if I could go back in time and, and give advice to my parents, um, I would probably um, just say, just just whisper something in their ear like hey this kid might not want to go to college <laughs> like um you know and and it doesn't really matter you know in that respect how how uh, what school you go to or how you're schooled like kids are geared towards certain things and homeschooling doesn't always support it depending on the style um and public schooling doesn't necessarily either it just depends you know if you fit into the mold of of what you know that particular schooling wants you to do and i think with homeschooling you can adapted a lot more to a, to a kid if you're really paying attention. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So did your, I mean, obviously, like, it seems like from a homeschool perspective, you would have, your parents would have at least um, taken you to do more things that you were interested in versus public schooling. So maybe you had a benefit there. I did in some ways. Um, the, the thing I was most interested in actually was computers, technology, and that was all spawned by video games. And my parents were like, you know, look, you're not playing video games 12 hours a day, um, which is a very valid, you know, very yeah. valid thing to say. Um, however, that interest led me into technology like crazy, which in turn, you know, looking back on it now, I mean, I'm using technology all the time for what I do as a career, whether it's my products that I'm selling online or just simply the social media aspect. So, you know, in hindsight, I would have loved for that to be encouraged. However, you know, they had no real way of knowing exactly. I mean, maybe I would have just turned into somebody playing video games at 35 and making nothing out of my life. So like, I, I, I kind of see their perspective, yeah. but yet, you know, the way it worked out, um, I would have loved for that to have been more encouraged and less on, you know, algebra and, you know, talking about, you know, calculus that could be coming. It's like, I don't care about any of that. Like it's okay. completely irrelevant to my life. And that that's helpful to know too, because, you know, you hear, you hear that type of thing is like, like you said, it's it would be hard from a parent's position to try to figure out what their kid is going to do it without trying to force them to do something that you want them to do. But at the same time, if you broaden your your range of what you introduce them to and what you 
you know, like if you show them new experiences that they could potentially be interested in, then you could see, you could see that developing and then you could train them in that direction, give them the guidance. So if they had figured out early on that you were interested in computers, maybe instead of just video games, they could have directed it more toward the stuff that you learned later. Like you talked about in your story, working at the the computer place and kind of learning how to build computers and things like that. So sure. that's helpful information to have, at, you know, as a parent that homeschools for sure. For sure. And, and, you know, I do recall one instance in particular um, where they, you know, I was interested in computers. And so I had an uncle, I mean, I still have an uncle, but um, who was a programmer. And so they kind of tried, they got me some books on programming and tried to guide me in that direction a little bit. And that just, again it was books numbers it looked like math to me i wanted nothing to do with it yeah. um so so maybe it was more you know it's it's not like they didn't try but you okay. know that that just wasn't it <laughs> it's more hands-on type of stuff for sure very much so very okay. much so hence the homesteading you can't really homestead if you're not hands-on you have to be able to do stuff for yourself exactly and as much yeah. as i'm into technology and stuff you know i was also into really just like physical labor like my first job that involved physical labor, I just loved it like crazy. Like, and I don't know why I just did like. Okay. Um, so, so in your story, you also mentioned that your parents, um, I don't, I, all you said was that they had the idea that sticks were dangerous. And so <laughs> in my mind, I went to this place of like, I wonder how sheltered he was from, you know, dangerous things that aren't really so dangerous. Like obviously some things are dangerous, some things are not. Playing with sticks could be dangerous, but it could also just be a very natural thing. And I think that most homeschooling parents would encourage that more so. But when you said it in your story, it kind of threw me for a loop. So I was curious if that aided you in wanting to be more hands-on and kind of like pushed you even further away from books. You know, I, I just, I'm curious about that whole premise. It, it might have. Um yeah because i mean I, there were sticks that would fall in the backyard it was a quarter acre you know suburban lot um and i just i love to play with sticks i also love to swing them around and stuff and my parents were probably concerned i was going to clock one of my siblings with them which <laughs> is a valid concern like i'm a kid right yeah um you know but i don't believe i really you know used a hammer to do anything um because again it was kind of like a stick but it's got a piece of steel on the end so right. you know dangerous um I, but you know i ended up being a carpenter um for essentially 15 years of my life and it definitely would have been an advantage to know how to pound nails before i just got thrust into a full-time um job as a laborer and you know I, I can't even you know pound nails into anything with my with my hammer i mean i learned but it would have been cool to to have known that ahead of time yeah that's fascinating i i remember um when we first talked and you told me about your construction company at the time i was I had been doing renovations for, I don't know, maybe like three or four years. And so it was cool to see where you were because you had gotten yourself to a you know fairly successful business to the point to where you were ready to jump into homesteading. And I was like, man, you know, that's exactly the path that I want to take. That's where I want to go. And so I, I totally can relate on the, the renovation side, all the construction stuff, but my introduction to it was much different than yours. Cause I was, I was driving nails in when I was like seven years old, you know, that was really fun for me. So. Definitely a little different there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, most most people in the construction industry that I met, you know, had been doing it since, you know, a very yeah. young age. And it's kind of cool to see that, like, my lack of experience until I hit age 18 didn't hinder me at all. Because, again, I ran my own business after I worked for a company for nine years. And, you know, I overcame it and learned what I needed to learn. Yeah. Do you think that you were sheltered from, from like, the outside world? Did your parents introduce you to you know just various things of life i mean a, a lot of a lot of homeschool situations are like very closed off to the outside world which is you know on one hand like i said since we homeschool i get it i i kind of understand um the sheltering idea but at the same time i definitely don't want my kids to resent and just rebel completely so i want them to have a full introduction to the world around them i just want it to be done by me instead of peers so what what was it like for you Sure. And it, it was probably more sheltered than I would have preferred. Like, I mean, even using, now again, it's, it's back far enough um, that like, you know, just using the, the telephone, for example, I think I was 16 before I was allowed to, to, you know, use, use the phone. But then again, who was I going to call anyway? First of all, I was an introvert. And second of all, like, I, you know, would I have public school friends? Not really. Um, but the last 
two years of, of my schooling, um, ended up going to like a co-op. So every, I think it was every other week, Friday, it was set up with a bunch of homeschool families, just like a, a school, if you will, and classes and all that. So, well, I was like, you know, in my opinion, still over sheltered, like they, it wasn't just like a completely like, you know, isolated environment. And especially as I got older, they did open up more and, and present more opportunities and all that. Okay. So you got more of the social aspect later in the homeschool journey with the, with the co-ops. I did. I did. Yep. And, you know, if I'd gone to public school, I would have gotten a lot more social experience for sure. Um, but then again, you know, we went to churches all the time and I got social mm -hmm. experience there to a point. Yeah. I also got bullied, you know, in, in those scenarios. Um, you know, people weren't nice and I'm already an introvert. So regardless of whether I was in a regular schooling environment or homeschooled, I still would have been introverted and withdrawn. Like it, it was my personality. Yeah, I, I can see that. Is that still your personality today, despite, you know, doing all the social media and having the, the presence and following that you do on social media? Absolutely. Um, I, one, one thing that just kind of helps is when I'm, you know, making a video, it's just me and the phone. I'm not literally yeah. speaking in front of millions of people. However, in reality, I'm speaking to millions of people. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, doing, doing a live, um, you know, is, is usually more just whatever, like it just feels weirder when I'm like in front of a live audience. Um, but a lot of, a lot of, you know, I've learned to appear like an extrovert just simply because of my experience um, being a contractor. There's customers to interact yeah. with um, lots of like, just conversation I actually subcontracted for another contractor and we did doors and windows. And so I was meeting customers for the very first time, um, right there when I show up with materials to do the job and we're talking through, they think I'm incompetent because I'm younger and, you know, I install a door and they point to, you know, the gap between the framing and the door frame. They're like, what are you going to do about that? And, you know, yeah. obviously I'm filling it with like spray foam. Yes. It's window and door spray foam. No, it won't bulge, you know, but whatever. It's like, I'm filling it like, but we're not. And so I got myself into having conversations, even to the point where I'm still thinking through a problem while talking to them because the questions are so telegraphed anymore. Like, and that, it just kind of like makes me comfortable talking to people. I can articulate what I mean. And yeah, yeah, that's, I think that's one thing that a lot of people gravitate to from the content that you put out is it's, it's just very simple, but it's quality communication. Like you're clearly saying what you want to say. You're to the point. There's no, there's no difficulty with your communication style. So it must just be that you're, you just prefer to keep to yourself, which isn't a bad thing. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. For sure. And you know, that was kind of the other step of, of getting good with communicating and with people is getting on social media. I have somewhere around 10,000 short form videos behind me now. Um, and that has, you know, I, you can go back and watch my early stuff. Please don't because I can't communicate. <laughs> I'm not talking clearly. I don't know what words to use. Like as, as time has gone on, I have absolutely made a uh, better um, appearance, which just simply in short form content and helped me because I have to put this info in 60 seconds and put it there. Um, yeah. I learned a lot from it. It taught me. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, Hey, I guess that's with anything too, like that. Obviously if you stick with something that development comes over, that's the journey of it all. Sure. Yep. In, in your story, um, you talked about the situation with your ex-wife and seemed like one of the turning points to, to me, at least from what I heard, was you were really focused on what we just talked about, developing and growing. Like, obviously, gr growing your business is going to require a lot of time. And so you were putting a lot of time and energy into growing your business, and your intention was to provide a better life for you. And, and I'm guessing you were anticipating having a family and doing it all for that. And so what, what have you learned throughout the process with your ex-wife and also growing the business and the dedication and the time that it takes, how, what have you learned to balance those things? What, you know, how do you manage the balance between those two things? Cause it's definitely not easy to do that either. No, it's not. Um, and, and part of, part of it is like, I mean, you, you have to prioritize. And so the way people budget money, I budget time. Um, and I don't really budget money all that much. I just make sure stuff's profitable and less is going out than, than is coming in. Um, but I budget time. And so, so much amount of time has to go towards making money, promoting business, whatever it is. And you have to leave a certain amount of time for not doing that and for family or for other things that are a priority. 
Um, that being said, when, when you're starting a small business, like it takes every waking minute to absolutely drive that thing to be successful or your startup time will go from two years to six years, you know, and you won't actually be successful because you've only half-heartedly attempted. And I, I'm, I'm an all or nothing type of person. I mean, I've, I've worked on my business, um, even the social media and <clears throat> all the products I have, um, I've definitely put in days back to back over 16 hours. Like, you know, I've, I've fallen asleep places that were not my bed because I just got exhausted and I wasn't done yet for the day. Yeah. Um, so there is an aspect of that. And I think, you know, if you're married, your wife should, you know, it's got to be a together thing. You're either both working on the project or you're working on it separately and you're going to go separate ways sooner or later. Like you've got to be on board with it. But at the same time, you can't just endlessly, you know, this is year five now and, and I'm still, you know, working 16 hour days. Like you either needed to scale back or pack up that business isn't successful. Yeah. That, I mean, and that that's exactly it. Like it's just that it's a challenge to balance those two things. Well, because obviously you need to give your time and energy to the people around you. That's most important. But at yep. the same time, if you don't develop your skills in a business or develop a business in general, you end up just being stuck in a dead end position that you don't want to be in, which you mentioned how you were in your job, your construction job that introduced you to construction for, I think like nine years or something like that. And you realized that it was not really going anywhere. I mean, eventually you got promoted, but that's a long time to be in one job that doesn't have a whole lot of growth opportunity. And if you don't start putting more effort into developing some kind of business or your work, then you kind of just stay stuck there. So that's right. It, yeah. It's, it's challenging to navigate that having a family and operating business for sure. It is. Yeah. And I, you know, I ultimately think it's got to come down to you. You guys got to have the same goal, you know? So before you start a business, make sure that your significant other is on board with what it's actually going to take. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a lot of conversations and a lot of, um, well, difficult conversations at that because, you know, sometimes your spouse is like, no, I just want to, I just want to go travel. And it's like, I do too, but we can't travel if the funds aren't available to go travel. <laughs> so for sure. You have to figure out how to do both, you know? Yep, you do. And, and you have to be careful not to get burnt out. And I'm, I'm the sort of person that I do get burnt out. Um, it takes years. Like I'm four years into homesteading. I'm starting to feel it now. Most people mm -hmm. are burned out nine months in and they're just like, you know, but I, I can go for a long time, like at a ridiculously intense rate before I start, before I start feeling it. That says a lot to, to pacing, right? Like, I could tell just by watching your videos and interacting with you, you're, you have a very patient and methodical approach, which I think is why the burnout doesn't happen as quickly. It's, it's like the, the story of the tortoise and the hare, right? Yeah. The, the rabbit runs as fast as he can for a very short amount of time and then he gets tired or takes breaks versus if you take the slow, steady approach, then you can, you can last longer and not get burnt out so easily. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, it's it's the steadiness. I mean, people comment all the time, you know, oh my gosh, I'd have built that in two weeks and it took you six months. And, you know, it's like, yeah, but I kept working on it and I kept going and I accomplished everything else that kept coming up in the middle of my project. So, yeah, it's, it's totally a tortoise or, or hare approach. Yeah, I love that. Um, also in your story, you talked about your, your family life early on and how there was some dysfunction there. And so could you kind of walk through the process of healing from that dysfunction, the, you know, the issues that you had with your siblings, which obviously didn't really go away, but what about your perspective on the take? Like, you know, have you broken those cycles? Just what does that look like for you now? Sure. Um, yeah, no, I mean, my siblings and I, like, we didn't really get along almost from the start, you know, it's, it's the typical, like, um, you know, older child, middle child, younger child scenario. I'm the oldest one. Um, ended up picking on my younger brother quite a bit. Um, probably, you know, looking back, you know, I was picked on by, you know, people at, at church and, and whatever. So, like, I was just kind of repeating a pattern of behavior. Doesn't excuse it, but, um, yeah, it, it was one of, it's one of those things, you know, I can recognize why it existed. And as, you know, both my younger brother and I got into our adult years, at least to my knowledge, you know, it was all water under the bridge, you know, I, I had to go and just apologize to him. And, and he said, you know, we're, we're good. And, 
you know, it was over and obviously I've been, you know, keep treating him badly and, and, uh, yeah. No, it's, it's definitely not always easy to get along with siblings, but I think it, it's just a, it seems like it's almost exclusively a problem of immaturity. And sometimes age helps you grow out of that immaturity. And sometimes it doesn't, in some cases, the age means nothing and the immaturity just sticks around indefinitely. For sure. That's definitely true. <laughs> uh, you, in your story also with your ex-wife, I think one of the big things that stood out to me is that you, you mentioned at least once, maybe twice, how you were pushing for professional help in, in the form of counseling. And yeah. I just, I find that interesting because not a lot of people want to confront their problems like that. So what was your mindset during that, that process? Um, my mindset was, was really pretty simple. Um, you know, we were, we were having dysfunction in, in the marriage. I wasn't treating her good. She wasn't treating me good. We, you know, had, a, had formed habits of the way we interacted that was just toxic. Um, and I kind of identified it. I saw my own faults, at least to an extent. And I'm like, we, we just can't continue like this. Like it's either, you know, going to fall apart or we're going to get over it. And so, and I, and I just told her like, we're, we're not getting over it. We have to, and some of it had to do with, you know, the affair too, because I wasn't really, I was trying to get over it, but it, it's not something you just, you know, say get over it. And then you're like, Oh, I got over it. Cool. Um, yeah. so it, it was, it was one of those, one of those things. And she didn't want counseling. She did not want to, you know, she was ashamed of, of what she did. And of course she doesn't want to talk about it. And I'm just like, we have to like do something to try to move past it or we're not gonna. Yeah. And there's so much wisdom in that. Cause you, you really, you don't just heal, you know, No, it doesn't, it doesn't just happen on its own. I think that's kind of the expectation that a lot of people have is like, let's just move on. And it's that trauma, trauma situations don't work that way. You don't just move on past them. You have to navigate and regulate through all of that. That's that's exactly right. And, and, you know, people say time heals all and then the word grudge exists. And if that word would simply not exist in our language, if time actually healed everything, it doesn't. Time can heal stuff, but time can also lead you to be a resentful, bitter person instead yeah. of, you know, an angry in the moment person. Then you're just resentful and bitter. So you have to do something and repeatedly do some things along the path so you can be somebody who's a forgiving person who's actually moved past versus a resentful person. Yeah, I, I recently heard a quote. I don't remember exactly how it went, but essentially the idea is time doesn't do anything. The character that you build or don't build is what brings the change. Sure. Yeah. And it's so true. Like obviously time could just keep going on forever. And if you don't do anything, it stays exactly the same. Yep. I agree. <laughs> when you, you brought up the affair and I did, I, I'll touch on it briefly. You mentioned how you thought that it was, or she was telling you that it was, I mean, in a roundabout way, she was telling you it was your fault, right? That you were gone all the time you were working. And, and so that was her response, which is, seems incredibly irrational to me. And then you mentioned when you did go to counseling and it was pretty effective counseling, you mentioned that they told you the counselor told you that it wasn't your fault and affirmed that to you. And so I was curious, was that the first time that you were, that you fully accepted that, that it wasn't your fault? Or did you have doubts and kind of think that maybe you were guilty and it was your fault that she took the actions that she did? So, I mean, I, in my head, I knew that it wasn't my fault. I believed it was my fault, regardless of, of what I knew. Um, and, you know, up to that point and even after that point I still you know I mean there were still things I did wrong and so guilt is a very powerful emotion and it tends to overwhelm the logic side of you and it's very easy to see from the outside of a situation which is partially why counseling or something is is helpful because you need an outside perspective outside of your own outside of your own emotions um and yeah. so I, I still a lot of the time believed it was my fault you know if i'd have been a perfect person then this wouldn't have happened and that's probably true however i couldn't possibly be a perfect person and um regardless you know it, all those issues and things that i didn't do right were my fault and led to marriage problems however an affair is a choice beyond any of that and it, that was her response and that just is unacceptable in all circumstances yeah, and it's but it's wild how that type of 
subtle manipulation can affect you and cause those doubts and those feelings of guilt and everything to be even stronger and then just keep contributing to the problem. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's wild. It's a, it's a lot to mentally uh, wrestle through. Yeah. So the, the counselors that you found were through a church, right? The That's right. Correctly. Yep. Yeah. And that, I mean, what was that process like? Cause typically you would expect, you wouldn't expect someone in a church to be like a professional counselor. Right. No, for sure not. Um, and, you know, whatever counseling stuff they did use that, you know, they, they kept God at the center of it. Um, but they were, you know, also very well, very knowledgeable in, in counseling from previous, like they weren't actually professional counselors at that moment in time. However, they had been. Um, so they were basically retired out of it. Okay. And so it was it was good because they just focused everything on god first and then they basically you know they're basically like if your priorities are aligned and you guys are then united on this priority you guys will come together and that's essentially the way it worked you know to be real brief about it anyway yeah so your faith was like kind of a roller coaster since childhood up until now what what has that journey been for you like obviously faith has been a big part of your whole journey so where are you at now and i i find it very interesting that there's always been something to fall back on and it's something that you came back to multiple times it seems like it is um yeah i mean basically i'll i'll just give a brief almost timeline of it you know i was a i guess i guess a, a baptist you know as a kid went to baptist churches age 16 my parents became mennonite so did i stayed with the Mennonites in my early 20s, left that, became Calvinistic in a weird sort of way um, in my th theology, um, basically almost, you know, acting like an atheist or an agnostic, and then came back to the Mennonites for about six months, went back to a church similar to Baptist, left that, started my own church, and then became a Torah observer and I would say at this point, I mean, I wouldn't even identify as Christian. I would identify as a Torah observer. Okay. So yeah, I was going to ask what, what's your current position based on the whole roller coaster and everything that brought you to where you are, <laughs> your current position, then you would say is a Torah observant, just a, a Bible, whole Bible believer follower. Yeah. Um, I probably back off of that a little bit. Um, the Torah, the prophets and the new Testament, I would almost view as less important, more like commentary, valuable information. I don't believe it conflicts the Torah in any way whatsoever. I just don't put the scripture authority on it. Okay. So the scripture authority for you is applied to the Torah specifically? It is. Okay. I, I mean, Hey, I can go with it. Like I'm <laughs> our, our past. I think that's, that's the way you found me initially when you reached out to me way back was it must've been like what, it was fascinating going back and listening to your story. Cause I could see this, the part where I briefly came in seemed like the time where you started to um, do your own home church and started to study and learn because yeah. you mentioned that you found somebody on Facebook talking about the Sabbath being on Saturday and you were trying to prove him wrong that it was Sunday that was the new day and all this stuff and you couldn't figure it out and I was going through the same journey and I started you know segueing my business into something else and then you found me in that in that moment and so I, through all of that journey and all of the study I've kind of I've come to a very similar place as you. Okay. That's pretty it's been, cool. It's been fascinating to see it just, yeah, I, I don't know. I wonder how many, I wonder like what the timeline is for most people, because that's one thing that, that I admired about what you talked about is you were faced with some situations throughout your journey in faith. For example, the Mennonites um, requiring that you button your top button. And right. one of the questions that you asked was, where is that in the Bible? And that's, the perfect question to always ask because i think and maybe this was your experience you could correct me if i'm wrong but i think a lot of people fall away from any type of faith because of what they experience with people in that faith and what those people say and do absolutely no i, I think that's right um you know it's it's hard not to do but when you you know get into a group of religious people um you assume that they are represent representatives of god and they're not um they you know, may say they are, they may try to be, they may reflect many things of God, but they don't officially represent 
God. And so if they do mean, hateful, spiteful things, you immediately think God is doing mean, hateful, despiteful things. God agrees with these people. That's not necessarily true. Yeah, and you mentioned that, that that was your reason for, or at least one of your reasons for believing that God didn't like you was because people who were allegedly godly people didn't like you. Yep. And I, when you mentioned that you went to, um, I, I kind of got the, probably have the timeline a little bit mixed up, but when you mentioned that you went toward Calvinism, I laughed a little bit because, and I'm curious what, like what brought you to Calvinism and what convinced you that that was, that that was true? So I couldn't shake the belief that God existed because there's just been too many coincidences throughout my life that there can't be that many coincidences. That's a whole other coincidence. Like yeah. God exists and I fully believe that and believing that, and you know, I was able to look at my own life too and see I wasn't perfect. So like, how am I a Christian if this is how I'm behaving? This is what I'm thinking. Um, and so I basically just started searching all kinds of different religious ideas. I knew of Calvinism and I was like, Hey, you know, you're either predestined to hell or heaven. And it all of a sudden everything fit. It's like, well, I'm predestined for hell. That's why I keep behaving this way. That's why all God's people hate me. And so I'm like, cool, I believe in Calvinism and I'm just on the wrong side and there's nothing I can do about it. And philosophically it fit perfectly. And that's what I went with. It's such a, I mean, it's a, it's a strange place to be in because you completely, you just completely ditch all of your control over your own life whenever you start to think that way. And how, I mean, how long did that affect you? Like how long was it that you assumed that you were just chosen to be on the wrong side and you had no power over any of your destiny? It was probably a period of a year and a half to two years. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was quite a bit of time. And that's that's a long time to kind of put your life on hold and not really not really try to achieve or attain any different worldview. You know, like I it's hard for me to wrap my head around it. I've I've had a lot of discussions about Calvinism and you know, I've read up on it a lot, but very clearly to me it doesn't fit the scriptures whatsoever there's there seems to be choice in every aspect of life even regarding faith and right. i mean there's calls to action all throughout the scriptures of the necessity for you to choose to either follow the commandments or not follow the commandments and you know it's, it's just riddled with examples of the necessity for you to choose absolutely you you talked about once you figured out that that's where you were, you know, once you decided that you were on the wrong side of the Calvin Calvinism team, you decided that you, at some point, you decided that you were going to be the absolute best person that you could be. And what did that look like? Were you, were you trying to do good things according to the scriptures or were you trying to do good things that we as a culture say are good or what, was, what did that look like? Yeah, I, I would say it's, it was a mixture of both, um, you know, treating others with, with kindness, um, you know, but but also, you know, following along with, with what scripture says about treating people, how to treat people, you know, I could have gone right into, you know, stealing and murdering and, and all this stuff um, yeah. that, you know, hey, I'm on the wrong team, right? I can do all this stuff. Um, I pretty much chose, like, I'm going to, at the end of time, I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to be like, I know I wasn't chosen, but this is all the stuff I did. And in my attempt, I know it wasn't good enough and going to hell anyway, but hey, I tried and, you know walk into the fiery pit on my own crazy that's a crazy place to be in i wonder why it seems like communism contributes a lot to the idea that nobody can be good like i don't know it's it doesn't it just doesn't jive with scripture that that you can't be a good person and you can't do good things and that there's not value in doing that but i it's very undermined in most religions like it's it seems like it doesn't matter whether you do good or not you know sure yeah, no, uh, it's it's a there's a lot of talk of, you know, faith is all you need and works. You know, our filthy rags don't matter. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that's one of the one of the ones that's completely out of context. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, and I think that's one thing that I've seen most often with you know not in every case, but in most cases when you have any kind of discussion about these types of um, topics, you realize pretty quickly, at least if you've studied a lot you realize fairly quickly that 
the person on the other side of the conversation has only read bits and pieces of the scriptures that they're claiming to believe and follow. Sure. And you can see that that's why there's so many holes in their ideology. Yeah, I agree. Um, you also mentioned that, well, you decided you weren't religious anymore. Was that at the same time that you thought you were on the wrong side of Calvinism or did you, I mean, just now you mentioned that you never could just believe there wasn't a God. Did you ever get to that point? I didn't No, I, I just believed that God exists in some form and he hates me. Okay. So if you were to give advice to your younger self or somebody in your position who is kind of understanding God based on the people around them, what would you tell that person? I, I would just say that there's no man on the face of the planet that's actually a representative of God and just kind of use an analogy like, you know, let's say your your neighbor has five kids and every time you go to go to school in the morning, one of those five kids beats you up, takes your lunch money, maybe two or three of them do. Um, and I'll say, my dad told me to do this. And it's probably not long. And you're just going to think that that person's dad, those kids dad, is just a horrible person. Meanwhile, maybe this dad doesn't even know you exist. Maybe he knows you exist and doesn't hate you. Maybe he does hate you. You know, I mean, I'd, I'd throw it out there, like, but just make sure that if you know that God hates you or is against you, you're interpreting somebody else's actions that, you know, says they're doing it on, on their behalf, but may not be. Yeah, that the, the analogy with the kids and their dad, it, that's a really good analogy because you do, you get exactly that. I mean, you know, God told me this or the Bible says this or God told me that. And it's, it's definitely completely distorted. I would say that if you want to know God and you want to know his character, anything about him, you have to go to the source. Sure. Absolutely. which is scripture mm -hmm. it yeah. is of course there's the whole thing where scripture has been interpreted by man and translated yeah. by man and, and so like i understand that whole argument and honestly i don't know the scripture well enough as in like i don't know hebrew i don't really know what it says i'm relying on a man's interpretation or transliteration um but, you know, honestly, it's just because of the way my life has gone and the circumstances that I believe he exists because of the way he's responded to me or the fact that there's been 15,000 coincidences in my life to make me believe it. It's one of those. Yeah. Um, you mentioned I, I've been curious to know what was some of the things on your list, because you mentioned that there was 10 reasons that you came up with why God hated you. Yeah, um, I really wish I had written that list down because I literally do not remember most of them. Um, some of them, two of them in particular, I pretty much figured I had a a gotcha moment for God because there were people that had wronged me in the past, and I'm like, these people are going to have to come and apologize me for the to me for these specific things, and it's never going to happen. And both of those things actually came to pass, and I oh, wow. don't, I still don't understand how free will and everything works with that, but. On the other hand, I also know, like, I've wronged people before and felt overwhelming guilt for whatever reason. And so I may have been prompted to, you know, I still had the choice not to go and apologize to some people I had wronged. However, typically, that's what I did. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. What, what was it? How did you realize that God didn't, in fact, hate you? What was your, like, aha moment? Was it that, would you say? It, it, it was, I think... One of those was the last on the list, um, and I, <clears throat> I don't completely remember everything that was on it, but once that list had been cleared, particularly the last item that I thought was impossible, um, it was the reasons why I believe God did not exist or did not, you know, like me, and I was on the wrong side of, of God, um, and that's what I believed, and I believed it so strongly that once those things were gone, I'm like, well, I got nothing. Wow. Um, you mentioned earlier the idea of moving on. Like when I brought up counseling, you mentioned the idea of forgiving and moving on, which is like a common theme that you get, you know, that you're, you're taught and preached to that you need to just forgive and forget. But right. that's, that's incredibly unrealistic. Like life doesn't work that way. You can, you can forgive you know, you can even move on, but it comes with, it's such a journey and, and a long process. It's not, I think that it's preached as like kind of a get over it mentality. Yeah. And 
I just, what, what are your thoughts on that? Like, obviously it didn't work for you. No, it, it didn't. Um, you know, forgiving and moving on is really the, the way to do it. And ideally at some point you move on to the point where you're not thinking about it, not holding it against the other person, whatever it is, um, with certain major events, um, that's far more difficult. And the way, you know, the affairs and everything worked out is it was lying up to the point and then she was sorry after she was caught and there was no possible lie that would, would get her out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, and there was even, you know, two back to back and it was the same thing. One was going on while she was apologizing for the first one. Um, wow. so it was, it was one of those things where forgiving and forgetting like should have just gone out of my mind because it's impossible to forgive and forget when nobody's actually sorry. She was only sorry for getting caught. And I don't think there was anything once you've gone that far with it, like, I don't know what she could have done to actually be forgiven and, and you know, forgotten um, because she never, she had no opportunity even to display that she was sorry. Like it was just at a point of no return. Yeah. And that, and that's an interesting point that you bring that up because like, even, even with God and within the scriptures, there's the, there's our duty, which is repentant. Mm -hmm. You know, there's sure. that aspect of forgiveness. There's without repentance, there is no forgiveness. Like how, how could you be forgiven if you're just continuing to do the same thing over and over again? And it makes no sense at all. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's one of those, one of those things. I think there are things you can do to somebody where like forgive and forget does not exist. You know, at the end of time, it may be possible. It will be possible to, because everything that's been done will come to light. Intentions will all be revealed. And I think at that point, certain things can be completely forgotten and forgiven. But there are certain scenarios where you can forgive and move on. But to forget literally means forget the person and never interact with them again. That is sometimes the only option. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I think that's another thing, too, is some people have the idea that forgive means to still accept uh, the person, regardless of if they've changed or not. Sure. Yeah which yeah. is very toxic and it's and, and it's people people use that too you know that's a type of manipulation as well like you're supposed to forgive me yep. and, yeah. <laughs> that's that's Sounds right like that's, and that was your experience un until i went through it i didn't really think of but i mean just just imagine that you had you know cheated on your spouse and got caught and you were still cheating while you apologized and then you got caught you know a couple weeks later what action can you take possibly in this world that would be a good enough answer for them to move on. You you have what like what what can you do? I mean, you could I guess go up you know to a microphone on a stage and just say like literally I'm sorry like here's my public humiliation. But like yeah. even still, <laughs> like still like you you've just been repeatedly caught over and over and you've been deceptive the entire time when you were supposed to be sorry. I, I don't I don't think it's possible to move beyond something like that what got me going off of that that you just said is you were still really putting a lot of effort into working things out though i was i was and i think that that probably speaks to your all or nothing type of mentality that you talked about it does <laughs> yeah. yeah so there was a moment where you were willing to follow the mennonite group and whoever else was involved it was like <laughs> that part was fascinating too because there was like it seemed like there was two or three different um worldviews involved with trying to kind of dictate your relationship and how you would you know manage all of that there were. so you talked about how you were going to just go along with whatever they were telling you to do with you know to to work things out and you got the call from one of your friends who started talking to you about um mind control and things like that and and talking about joe so what I, I you kind of you like barely touched on that but i'm i was still curious about that story yeah no it was it was it was really something where like i just got worn down after you know so much time had passed and people are just talking at me for hours a day and sending me scripture and you know I, I just got to the point where i convinced myself and i shouldn't have but i got to the point where i convinced myself that like this was the only way to move forward i'm obviously such a bad person and like i can't see it and I shouldn't have doubted God because I would get down on my knees and pray, like literally covering myself with a tarp and sitting in a pile of ashes. I just pulled yeah. out of the wood stove. I'm like, 
I'm going to find whatever way I can to humble myself in front of my creator. Visually, I know it doesn't matter, but like, I'm going to visually do it anyway. Yeah. And every time I did that, I was pretty much left with a feeling as I've done all right. Like, and I had clarity of mind and things to say to them. And every time I would go to them, it would be confusion. And so it would be more confusion back and forth. And I should have been strong enough in my faith to realize it was nonsense, but I wasn't. Yeah, well, at the same time, though, you, you mix in that aspect of brainwashing. And if it's if it's kind of this textbook, like mind manipulation, it absolutely was. Yeah. And so you you would be somewhat victim to that no matter what, you know, like that. It's not it's not really a joke. It's not a game. That is a real thing. And so it's effective it because of that. It's, it's been studied well to be effective. <laughs> it has. It really has. And, you know, that's God obviously knew that. And that's that's what it took to have my friend call me and unprompted talk about brainwashing and talk about Job, those two subjects. I had already been thinking about Job and yeah. then I dismissed it because of course I'm thinking about Job. I want to play the victim and make myself be like Job. And and so like I dismissed it as my own mind, you know, wishful thinking, if you will. And I wanted to accept the possibility that I was not in a Job like scenario, that I was just an evil, horrible person. But I wonder where that comes from. Like that seems like that maybe contributed uh, from your past faith journey because y you get that often where people are not willing to validate themselves whenever they're in a position where they truly are, you know, you really were a victim of some treacherous activity, yet yeah. you wrestled with this idea of comparing yourself to Job, which was completely valid at the time the way it sounds i mean obviously it's one side of the story but right if 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 the thoughts and the feelings are valid and they're accurate i wonder what it is that causes that that um, situation where you don't really want to compare yourself to someone like joe I, I think for me it's just my interaction with with people throughout my lifetime and including my wife you know she would you know almost if you will invent a scenario where she's not the bad guy no matter what, in mm -hmm. some way to explain. And so I watch people try to justify themselves by lying to themselves or finding any, just grasping at straws for some way where it's not their fault, they're not wrong. Um, and so I thought I was observing that that behavior in myself where like, am I really grasping at straws for anything that makes me not the bad guy here? Yeah, which is, I mean, it's fair to, you know, to do that self-analysis it but is. at some point you have to realize like, okay, the situation's messed up. I literally haven't done anything that I can find fault within myself. So it's not wrong to feel and think that way. And that's what I dislike is that it's viewed as a bad thing. It's like, if I look at myself as Joe, it's viewed as a negative where Joe right. wasn't really, he wasn't taking pity on himself. He was just defending himself. Like I didn't do anything wrong to deserve all of this. It's just that this is, you know what god has in store for me right now yeah yep exactly but obviously joe wrestled with it himself and of course his friends didn't yeah. didn't help um and yeah. i mean that's the other reason i kind of felt in that position too it's like i had friends that weren't very helpful either you know friends <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that obviously wasn't who they were it's crazy it, it's hard to it's hard to see through that type of stuff though especially when there's like you said, when there's faith involved and you're, you know, you're kind of giving them the position of being a godly type person, you hold them to a higher standard and you look past some of the, the red flags, as you would say. For sure. So that was kind of the end of that whole situation because you had the conversation with your friend. And like you said, it was one of the 15,000 coincidences that had happened <laughs> in your life. And so it pushed you to the point of, finally ending all of that situation. And that was when uh, it seems like that's when the homestead started to become more of the focus and when it started to flourish more. It did. Yep. I mean, it did begin, begin the process of me eliminating these people from my life, which included buying the land out of their names and, and going through a divorce. But once that was concluded and while it was concluded, the homestead was starting to flourish a whole lot more. So when you initially called me, years ago i if i remember you were debt free at the time i was okay and 
so we talked about that and you were you were ready to homestead and i remember i was like man go for it this is awesome you're one of the only people <laughs> that i've talked to that is like actually at the point to pull the trigger on such a thing you know right. but then you got back into debt with all of this divorce and now you're debt free again so talk to me about the necessity of being debt free debt free and the benefits that come with it and homesteading debt free and all those kinds of things yeah um so being debt free is just a big stress burden that's that's lifted off your shoulders particularly when homesteading because i mean even now like my income is not consistent at all and so if you work on a homestead that's in debt and let's say you've worked on it for five years and you still owe you know another five years you hit hardships everything you've worked for could be taken by the bank and partially completed projects you know are worth nothing to someone else and you essentially lose not only your property potentially but that whole block of time that you spent so the debt-free homesteading would you consider it to be financial peace i would consider it financial peace yes it's it seems like the points that you made, if you have a truck payment or something like that, and you don't have a reliable steady income, especially because you're on a hundred acres, you know, and you're, that's what's consuming your time. It seems like the most practical position to be in. Yeah, I, I think so. And it's, you know, it's still possible that you don't have financial peace because you do need some money to exist and you never know if the county is going to up your taxes a thousand percent or something um, probably wouldn't happen but hey um so it, it's not impossible but like it's probably as good a financial piece as you can get since since stopping the construction business and being on the homestead and starting your other business you know the, the social media and the products and things like that has your perspective on earning money changed do you still i mean you said you still spend a lot of time working on your business obviously but you have so much less financial obligation that in my mind your your whole perspective around earning money would be a lot more relaxed yeah and that would be true if i hadn't gone through that whole scenario of getting plunged back into into ridiculous debt again um so once i hit a certain financial threshold and diversify some investments and some of that i probably will i did um, once I was debt free the first time, I just said, you know, hey, I'm good and totally had that, you know, piece about like, I don't have to worry about making money every day and, and stuff like that. And then I discovered other people can put you in a really bad position. And so my perspective has changed to the point that I need enough assets that I can still sell stuff off or use them, you know, to continue to make money. Um, so it's at this point it's beyond you know just being debt free for me based on my experience of I've, I've only had this mindset for the last approximately two years because mm. of all that that took place yeah. yeah you you've gotten creative though with your circumstances and what do you think that anybody can be creative like that and just you know kind of roll with things on the fly if they i mean obviously you were groomed for that based on running your own business but right is that something that you think most people could do? I think they could if they're if they want to bad enough and they're willing to learn. You have to have a mindset that's open to learning and you have to know how to learn, which is a major thing. Um would you but, say that oh sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean you you do I do think anybody can do it if they want to bad enough and understand that thinking outside of the box is mandatory. Yeah, that would you say that's the main thing is the inability to allow yourself to think outside of the box because most people seem to just kind of want to stay in their lane and not get out of that. For sure, no, I, I do think that that people you know place their own mental restrictions on themselves because they're comfortable, and so I know how to make money at my nine to five, or I know how to make money in this conventional business, and I just have a general confidence of about myself that I can be in any scenario and make the best of it and so you know even on social media I do certain things that and people are doing wild crazy stuff on social media and, and I still find ways to repeatedly go viral in ways that other people you know with things that other people really haven't and so it's it's just constantly out of the box thinking and I've just to just as an example I put Google no I didn't I didn't put googly eyes on a lamp um Jen, Jen my girlfriend made a cardboard eyes and put a 
pupils on them and I stuck those on a lamp and I put it on a live and had over a thousand viewers for quite some time watching this lamp and I named the lamp Lampula and it was just a lamp sitting there with a the plant next to it and people created this whole backstory for it and you know they had their whole creativity thing going and you know just just absolutely wild stuff other people are out like you know crashing junk cars and getting views that way and I'm like oh, I yeah. put cardboard eyes on a lamp and and get views yeah that well I I like that that's been kind of the route of your creativity is I've heard you say a couple of times that you sell coffee and you sell beard products um some merchandise and things like that but I've heard you say you like coffee and you have a beard and you take care of it and so that's kind of the route that you've gone so it seems like realistically anybody could could categorize their pursuits that way in the sense of I like such and such so how can I be creative enough to earn money doing it for sure yeah and it's it's one thing I've, I've done throughout my whole life um to different degrees of success but the thing my hobbies I've turned into money-making businesses um I've, I've just always done that yeah that that's been my philosophy too is that you can at least in America, you have that opportunity for sure to take whatever you like and find a way to make money at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I think you can. I mean, you do. You have. You still have to have the fundamentals of business, which is being dedicated and and um, you know, the, the whole customer service aspect and the financial aspect. Like you have to have those fundamentals behind you, but you can essentially take anything and and make it into a business if you're passionate enough about it. Yeah. Yeah. So would you say that some of the main characteristics needed would be passion, maybe presentation and work ethic? Yeah, probably put work ethic first. Yeah. <laughs> <But> yep. <laughs> yep. Nothing, nothing just, I mean, the other thing I, I tell people too is everybody, at least we'll go with America because I've not been anywhere else. So I can't speak for them, yeah. but everybody in America has, in, throughout their lifetime probably has two to three major opportunities that could make them ridiculously successful and wealthy everybody has them and the vast majority of people squander them um, for me one of the things was somewhat blowing up on social media um, and i have absolutely capitalized on it and pushed really hard three years after the first kind of explosion to get to the yeah. point where i am now yeah and that that comes from the work ethic it does yeah and so sometimes when good stuff happens to you because good stuff happens to everybody sooner or later if you work hard to capitalize on it like don't don't squander your opportunities some people will get something real quick you know i see a lot of people blow up on social media push real hard for three months get a couple free items sent to them by people that like their content and that was the extent of it wow yeah you mentioned um going viral for for several things and I remember one of the first videos that I saw after you had, uh, it was one of your viral videos and it was a short video talking about how people assume that homesteading is this, you know, low income, trashy, just like not trying very hard, repurposing everything type of situation. But you explained how it's not and you showed how you have your paid off truck and your nice washer dryer combo and stuff like that. So why do you think it is that that's the perspective of most people about homesteading, that it's just like a trashy type of thing. Well, a lot of people um, run their homesteads in such a way where it is that way. Um, and it, it's, you know, not a knock against anybody homesteading. And I've definitely homesteaded in that exact scenario myself. Um, but people in, in general, you know, financially, um, you know, they get a surge of money or something, they put it on this, or they put it on that, and then they're content again. And I've just never been content with the idea of my homestead existing in this particular position it's in and so I've always found a way to push hard to go beyond it and I used to watch a lot of homesteading content before I started and I'd see people doing stuff that I just thought was ignorant and instead of leaving dumb comments I made mental notes and I'm like when I homestead if I homestead I'm going to do this differently and I've applied most of the things that I've witnessed and then yeah changed yeah so there's definitely a difference between being frugal because it seems like you've been very frugal with your money versus mm -hmm. being cheap and trashy there is there, there's a huge difference and you know despite the fact that i have a 
truck that's definitely not a low end um truck you know i'm still happy to build something out of pallets or you know eat a cheap meal somewhere um just because you know money you know i like to save money the reason i save money is to spend it on stuff i want to spend it on so yeah there's certain things that i want to spend money on i don't know how to build a truck out of sticks out of the woods as soon as i figure it out i'm going to let everybody know but i don't know how to do it so <laughs> i'll build the things i can with sticks out of the woods and you know buy a truck yeah well unfortunately too i think most people go broke because they're so concerned with their status but they're trying to reach right. the status of a nice truck way before they can pay for it <laughs> that's exactly right um and yeah. it's 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 one of those things that you know status just really shouldn't mean what it does to most people um and i find myself in a unique situation where purchasing a truck should generate income and has generated income and there's a tax deduction on top of it so there's you know most businesses can't justify buying a truck that appears flashy social media is one of those businesses that that does seem to work out yeah yeah i've seen so many of your comments saying that you're a fake because of some of the nice stuff that you have <laughs> Yep, absolutely. I get a lot of them. Yeah, funny. That's uh, the wrong yeah. definition of the word, though, because if I was being fake, you wouldn't know about the truck, and then you wouldn't call me fake. Yeah. But hey, whatever they want to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's it's a relief to see your ability to just brush it off and keep doing what you're focused on doing. Yeah, it's and and I wish I had a way to convey how to do that to other people. Maybe someday I'll figure it out, but um. I, I think in a lot of ways, like a lot of people say, I don't care what other people think about me. I think being honest with myself, I do not care what other people think about me. Yeah. That's a, that's a freeing place to be. Whenever, when I first started coaching, I was really concerned with what people would think about what I would say, or if I would offend them or something like that. Not that I was going to be rude or anything, but you know, telling someone the truth about their particular situation is sometimes hurts quite a bit and so <laughs> at the point when i decided i just don't care what anyone thinks anymore i was able to have way better conversations and they surprisingly the people would be a lot more receptive to that style of coaching as well sure that makes sense um your your online community is seems like it's a big part of you know everything that you've built so far so i am curious about how you view community and if it's as necessary to you to have in-person community as you do online community. Yeah, um, I do think in-person community is preferable over remote community, if you will. Um, I put value in all of it, but I do have very close relationships with my neighbors. Um, and at the same time, online, I, ha I have quite a number of people that I have, you know, as close to relationships with as you really can. Um, I, I, strongly value community. I think uh, people are social beings, even if they are introverted like me, I still think they're social beings. And it's, you know, sure, you might be able to survive on your own, but I don't know if you can really thrive on your own. Yeah, so being in your situation where you're more distant from people around you, and because, you know, homesteading seems to be isolated. I don't know your particular situation that well, so I don't know if you truly are isolated like that, but does it does it become more important to have people around you once you get out and away from society so to speak i think it does um and yeah i mean i am on 100 acres my neighbors are approximately a mile away and i have other neighbors that are multiple miles away i, I don't know really where to draw the neighborhood line but um yeah just, you know we have distance so i don't just walk over to the neighbors and knock on the door i jump on the atv and drive to the neighbors and knock on the door um yeah. but i never knock on the door because if it's that nice out there outside doing something <laughs> um so i i have you know i also lived on a tenth of an acre in a small city and lived there for 10 years never uh other than waving to some of them like i waved to some of them three or four times in the entire 10 year span and that was the extent of the interaction so I'm closer with my neighbors now than I have ever been any place else I've lived. And that's fascinating because there's so much more distance between you. Yeah, and, and there is. And, and some of it's the lifestyle. I mean, there, there's been a number of times I have the longest driveway of my closest neighbors. Um, it's, a, it's a half mile long. And they're usually, they're all like closer to the road because, you know, when like 
16 trees fall across their driveway, it's not that big of a deal because 16 trees can't fall across their driveway. Well, mine, it can. And yeah. so oftentimes, you know, if it happens, you know, we're all out cutting trees and everybody gets firewood and I get out and, you know, that, that, that's pretty cool. It's, it's just, you rely more on your neighbors out here. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the real sense of community. It is. When you, when you talked about finding Minion, your dog, and you said that you found purpose and when you were telling your story, my mind went to that idea of community. And so I, I wanted you to elaborate on what you said that you found Minion and you found purpose. Can you elaborate on that, son? Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of, I think a lot of it's personality trait. Um, I'm the type of person that like, if I was the only person that existed and you know, this is the reality I lived in, I'd probably just literally live in a hole in the ground with tarp over my head and, and call it good. Like I'd be like, whatever. Um, but when it comes to taking care of something else, like my sense of responsibility is just ridiculously elevated. And so I had Minion to take care of and my sense of responsibility was elevated and I needed to train him and he needed to be fed and, you know, all this, this stuff. And so it, it gave me purpose as in something to take care of and love and be responsible for. Yeah, which at the time seemed like the perfect fit. One of the many coincidences again, I suppose. Absolutely. Yep. One of those so-called so coincidences. What would you, if you could give, again, your younger self advice or somebody else in, in a similar position, what would you say to somebody um, in regard to developing community and finding the right people, the right friends compared to the types of friends that you had previously? Yeah, that's that's tough. Um, you, you have to realize that there's acquaintances and there's friends. And just like people talk about red flags in relationships, you need to also apply red flags to just casual friendship relationships. Um, and that even includes acquaintances. You know, if, if somebody lies to somebody else and you're aware that they lied to them, that's a red flag that, hey, this person, you know, does this. And so you need to place a boundary you know, between you and them, whether it forces them into the acquaintance um, position forever or not, you know, it's up to you, but, but place boundaries and realize that most people's aren't, most people aren't your friends. And some of where I learned that is from growing big on social media. And well, I don't personally value the quote fame, like really highly, like it's super cool, but like, I, I just don't place like incredible value on that. Well, many of my friends did and jealousy came out and mm. I was unable to recognize it. And that led to some, some issues. Yeah. Yeah. You talked about that. It's, it's unfortunate that you, you couldn't see that in them previously, you know, before it all took place. Sure. Cause it seemed like once everything came together for you, you had no real issue with just putting a stop to it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's pretty much it. You know, I just kind of identified it's a very telltale jealousy is really easy to identify on most people because there are people that will just sit you down and just be like, I'm genuinely happy for you. And other people will be like, I don't get why, you, you know, you have this or why you're so popular or why. And I would just agree with them because I literally do not get it. Like, I don't know why I'm so popular. So I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I don't get it, but Hey, it's cool. Right. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, it's cool. Well, yeah, that was jealousy talking the whole time. They're like, you know, I don't get that. But that's an immediate red flag. And that person, you know, someone does that to me again, that person will never be eligible to be a friend. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, those those types of experience definitely provide really good lessons. They do. Yeah, they do. How, what, what have you... What have you learned about managing stress since going through all of those things and simultaneously being in a really peaceful living situation? Yeah, um, that's tough. Um, I don't know if I manage stress or just keep a lid on stress. I'm really not sure. Um, I, I tend not to react to things unless it's urgent and stress really isn't something I need to urgently react to most of the time. Um, so I really think honestly, taking a day off a week, um, yeah. is a huge step in, in stress management. Um, I push myself right to the brink of stress and then I push myself a little bit further and then I just keep going. 
Yeah. So you, so I mean, go figure, right? The designer of people uh, decided that we need to take a day to rest each week. Right. So it's kind of like forcing your hand to do that so that you won't burn out, like you mentioned earlier. For sure. Yep. I, I really think that's a that's a big key. Do you, <clears throat> on the outside looking in, it seems like homesteading is really peaceful. And I don't know if that's like, you know, because most people who are watching you are kind of living that vicariously. Um, would you say that this is exactly what you anticipated it being and that it is more peaceful? I would say it's exactly what I anticipated it being. However, I didn't anticipate it being peaceful until everything was built. Everything's not built yet. So it is just like a job um, in a lot of ways. And I don't know if it's actually going to be peaceful by the time I'm done building everything or not. I think it will be, which is why I'm pushing so hard towards that goal. Um, but I don't truly know because I'm not there yet. And once I get there, I'm just going to have to be careful to limit everything I get my hands into and make sure that I have less to be concerned with all the time. Yeah, which would which would be some of the stress management, right? Like if you don't take on too many things, you don't have as much stress. That's right. Yeah. And since I try to be efficient with my time, I take on just enough that I don't completely like crack and I've been doing it for four years now and I've made a lot of progress. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. What What's left? in your vision for the homestead as far as building um a garage a house um i have a basically what's going to be guest quarters um which i'm staying in right now which gives me time to build the house in the way i want to and i'll probably end up with a barn of some kind and that is for the most part it i'm probably going to end up rebuilding the duck coop at some point which i wouldn't consider a major project compared to say a house yeah um, and there's going to be some some different maintenance things to do. Um, but at some point, you know, I'm going to realize, you know, I'm right, right now I'm two years from being 40 years old. Um, I don't need this homestead to last 200 years. I'm not going to live that long. What was, what was kind of your initial idea for homesteading? Was it, was it just the idea of peaceful living or interest in growing your own food or what, what was it for you? It was, Probably some of both. I mean, a lot of it was freedom. You know, financial freedom was a part of it. Freedom in general, when you have 100 acres and you live on it, like you just have more like literal freedom. If you want to run outside screaming, well, you know, it's okay. Nobody's <laughs> going to notice. Um, so it, it, it's just, uh, yeah, it, it was mostly freedom. Um, providing my own food is definitely something that's important to me. I also realized that while I'm building the homestead, I can't focus on storing up all these canned goods because I don't have a basement in a house or any place to actually keep them. So food has taken a back burner um, for the most part, not always. Like I found foraging food is really awesome and I didn't have to plant anything. I didn't have to water anything. I just had to walk out there, pick it and eat it. That's cool. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because I remember you talking about growing your own food and I was curious where you were at on that journey. And if my, my incentive for wanting to do that is to be more in control of my health because of you know everything that we have access to is just not the best all the time sure yeah no for sure and i do want to grow my own food i'm going to get my own eggs from my ducks i'd like to get the flock big enough where i'm getting like a lot of my meat from the uh the male ducks that can be processed at the end end of every uh summer season fall um and they are other than about two to three months out of the year, providing their own food for themselves. So they forage completely everything. That's awesome. Would you say that homesteading has contributed to better health for you or even despite all of the things that you went through? Yeah, I, I would say it has. Um, while I work just as much, it's a different type of work and everything's so unique. Um, you know, if, if I'm, you know, doing a renovation, you know, it's a lot of stuff on the hands and knees and carrying you know, cabinets upstairs or something. And, you know, it's, it's the physical work is so diverse that my joints have gotten a lot healthier. Um, the food, you know, being, being healthier with food is definitely important to me, but I'm a really hyper-focused individual. So in some ways my health has not, um, increased just because, you know, well, I've, I've actually got a, uh, some kind of something in my eyelid right now, and I'm going to get a, some kind of eyelid surgery. It's not major. Um, but, you know, well, that's been there for nine months. Why? Because I can't take a day off to go deal with that. I'm busy doing this stuff. And so I'm so hyper-focused that it's like, 
I'm either going to survive and build everything how I want in my timetable, or I'm going to die trying. And that's just where I'm at. Oh, man. Don't die on this, Nate. I'll do my best. I've got, a, got Jen here to help me now. She's, you know, made sure that I eat every day and stuff like that. Because I literally just, I eat once a day and I'm pretty healthy with that. Well, switching to eating every other day really wasn't that healthy. But look, I'm tired and I want to, you know, get this done or I want to get that done. So yeah. I didn't die. So cool. <laughs> it worked out. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, th I think it's fine to, you know, figure out what your body can handle and how long you can fast like that sure i don't see a big issue as long as you're not compromising your health to the point of malnourishing yourself you know <laughs> yeah and i may have, have gotten a little too far a couple times there but i didn't die like i said what what have been some of the mental or emotional things that you've learned about yourself um like things that you've had to overcome or you know just all the situation all of the hard emotions that came through your story and then having to persevere through the challenges of actually pulling off this homestead feat. Yeah, it, it's, it's been a crazy emotional roller coaster. Um, you know, I've, I've gone through being super angry and being super hurt. And I mean, just basically every emotion that exists um, went through. It's been overwhelming. Um, honestly, having animals, ducks and a dog and, you know, increasing that as time goes on but like i literally can't just lay in bed and move about my life because those things are going to be out there and die so get up go deal with it and moving around physically doing things i think is really important for mental and emotional stability and throughout the whole process i've learned i'm a lot tougher of a person than i really felt like i was wow that's that's cool to learn about yourself you know because it it provides um more belief in yourself that you can accomplish hard things and it does the, the animals too <laughs> when you mentioned the animals i think about what you said about finding your dog minion and, and finding purpose and when you have that definite purpose you it gives you something to live for so that you can keep going i agree yep and and some people i really think can live for themselves and do just fine it's like i just want this i want that and so they're the things they want will drive them to do what they need to do to get them. And I don't know, for me, it, it's just like, I want to provide for, you know, other things, or I even just want to like, even just growing a business provides a lot of motivation for me. I want to this business to be successful. And so I'll push like crazy in some way. I need purpose, a project, animals to care for something. Yeah. When you, when in your story, you were acknowledging your workaholism, that's my mind kind of goes there. I start thinking about that when you talk about what you just said, like the situation with your eyelid and, you know, <laughs> trying to accomplish everything. So I, I said it earlier, it's important to take that self inventory and realize, you know, where your, what your downfalls are. So yeah. acknowledging that that is something that you face workaholism. What do, do you actively, uh think about that and try to mitigate that or do you just push through and keep going and um i would i would say up until three <laughs> months ago i just pushed through because I, I just want to accomplish um jen moving to the homestead and being here like i've been taking evenings off like my entire life like totally flipped around i've been watching a movie a night for like i don't know a month probably like and i just I wouldn't be doing that. I'd be editing videos until I fell asleep with the phone in my hand or, you know, what, whatever it is. And I'll struggle again when summer comes. Um, but I mean, I'm absolutely a workaholic. There's, there's no question about it. I'm, I guess, doing those things to try to somewhat not to be because, but again, me being a workaholic is what's driving me to take time off because I know if I keep going at this pace, I'll burn out and accomplish less as I go through a six month burnout period. So I'm only trying to stop myself from burning out so I can accomplish more over the next six months. Yeah. Well, it goes, like. <laughs> yeah. It, it goes back to what you were saying about budgeting and time. Cause there's, it does. there's actually a lot of research on that. A lot of books and things that talk about how people become less effective, the more they try to do without, you know, taking those necessary rest periods. And so like, um, uh, observing the Sabbath every week and all those types of things actually contribute to you being more productive versus, if you just try to work, you know, 16 hour days every single day, you, it, you get it, less done. 
That's exactly right. And and I have a story with that with my contracting business because I was a contractor working seven days a week. Um, and, you know, it was always Saturday was paperwork, Sunday was paperwork, or, you know, maybe Saturday was looking at jobs. Um, but I ended up when I discovered, you know, I needed to take a day off a week. I'm like, how am I going to accomplish all this stuff? I still have a business, you know, I'm still trying to scale this thing. And I would, I just tried to work, work it out and just, just took the day off. <clears throat> and I ended up, you know, I had my Monday, Tuesdays, you know, all the way to Friday, Monday to Friday, completely scheduled out. And almost every week without fail, Friday's work was done at the end of Thursday. Wow. And like, I mean, for weeks and weeks and weeks, like I, I can't explain it. It just happened that way. That's amazing. <laughs> it is it is so by the time saturday came like yeah sure i could do more and you know push the business harder but i just didn't believe in it so i didn't and the next week was always the same yeah yeah I, i've experienced very similar circumstances as i you know i prioritize taking the sabbath off every every week and in, initially when i started doing that saturdays were a high productive a highly productive day where i could get so many things done and you know, you, you can kind of sidestep some of the other business obligations and catch up on back work, but right. It, so it was kind of difficult to wrestle with that and, and not want to do it all the time. But then as time went on, <clears throat> it got so much easier and became so much more peaceful to just relax and unplug completely. Yeah. I, I think it's a process. I don't think you can go from <laughs> thinking about, you know, work seven days a week to like just turning your brain off a day a week. Like it, it, it took a while for me to actually do that, but eventually I did learn how to do that. Yeah. The The last thing I want to talk about, Nate, was you, you have this philosophy that you've said a few times that things take uh, at least two years to process and, and to, to cope with, I suppose. Yeah. So I'm interested on that perspective and, and how it came about. Yeah. I don't even know where I originally heard it. Um, I think I probably, I was constantly Googling um, how to get over, you know, somebody cheating on you because I wanted to get over it and be done with it. Um, and I think some somewhere in my findings, they, they basically said the two year mark, like, is some kind of mental shift. And I've experienced that numerous times throughout different, you know, traumatic events, where like, two years later, like, almost to the day, um, something just changes. And it's not like you're like, totally and completely over it. But I've wanted to tell this life story I've had for a long time now. And by the time I ended up recording it, um, or by the time I was ready to record, it still took me a couple of weeks to figure out how to do it, but it was two years plus a week. And mm -hmm. I found myself mentally ready. I don't really know how to explain it. And it's still an issue and it's still a, a wound, but yet something changes. And so if I could at all encourage anybody going through something, just, absurdly difficult and you just can't talk about it or, or whatever whatever the scenario is like every every single day of, of those two years is like the longest day of your entire life but it will get better and i've ended up being a success story a couple times just pushing through that two years and afterwards you know being a productive positive person yeah well it goes back to um what we were talking about earlier is that the time necessarily doesn't do it it's you know, I, I would be curious to kind of study and see like, what are the changes that happen over that course of two years? Because you have the healing phase, you know, you, you have the, you have the initial traumatic, um, highly stressful and emotional phase, and then you have the coping phase. And then once you start to heal from all of those situations and you start to become a better version of yourself and by right. that time in your circumstance, anyways, it's roughly two years and it speaks to, um, your approach, your patient approach with things. Like how you said, you know, taking six months to build your home, but it's exactly the way that you want it. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's completely different than how most things go with most people. It's more so get it done as quick as I can so I can move on. But then you end up suffering later because of that process. You do. Yeah. And I, I tend to be very future minded. And so I'm willing to go through hardship and difficulty and annoyance, you know, as long as it's going to benefit me in the future. And I can see that dream and, and have a plan to get there. And uh -huh. yeah, I mean, the, the two year thing is, is still like, you know, I mean, my whole like getting over a process is still continuing. I think two years marks a significant mental change 
emotional change probably but there's still you know more to process and more to go but things aren't like yeah absolutely awful every single day yeah well nate i i thank you for coming on the show and and uh sitting and talking with me about all these different things um it's it's fascinating to see people who have pulled off you know going through successes and failures and kind of that roller coaster ride which it is and i think that highlighting stories like this like yours shows that it's not all just butterflies and rainbows and that there's a lot to it so because it's easy for someone to look at your situation and be like oh well he's you know he's doing just fine he's got this great uh gig going or whatever but that when you get into the story of it all it's not like that yeah no that's that's right there's, there's a lot of ups and downs um and one of my philosophies is like everybody has bad days and, and some days you're just like i shouldn't have got out of bed this morning like i'm I'm set back further than when I woke up. Um, and I just tell people like push really, really hard through those bad days and accomplish something. And hopefully the next day I'll be better. And again, it's tortoise and hare thing where like, yeah. you know, you do your best to, to make progress and, and push forwards and a multitude of years with that philosophy will get you somewhere. Yeah. I totally agree that that little bit at a time makes a world of difference, but you, the problem is that you just don't see it right away. And so a lot of people just ignore it or give up on it. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you can be found at your name, Nate Petrosky, across pretty much every social media and, of course, on YouTube, right? That's right. Yep. I currently uh, have TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. And I'm constantly on the lookout for new platforms to expand to, but that's enough for the moment. Awesome. So go follow Nate. He, he puts out a lot of genuine, authentic content that's, it's been entertaining for me to watch. Um, I may have some bias because we, we agree on faith topics and, you know, I, I want to homestead as well. So, but either way, his content's awesome. So you guys go follow him. Uh, Nate, if you have anything, any final words of wisdom that you want to share, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I just just tell people, you know, if you've got goals and ambitions, um, believe in yourself. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, I put myself in a situation where I have the potential to make 10 times more mistakes than every normal person. And don't be afraid to put yourself in a scenario where you can really mess up. And for me, starting homesteading, the biggest mental hurdle I had to get over was like, I'm selling everything, taking a leap and buying this land and jumping into it. And then I just kind of realized I could always sell the land and go back to exactly what I was doing. And then I was like, well, okay, go for it then. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Thank you again. Appreciate your time and we'll, we'll keep in touch. Yep, and thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yes, sir.